good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, depending where you are. Welcome to this webinar on Metapad, how to complete the data evaluation record, DER, composers for pesticide and mammalian toxicology metabolism studies. We are running this webinar in collaboration with the UCPA. As you can see from, from the agenda, I will give you a brief introduction of the project, of the Metapad project. And at the end of the webinar, I will summarize the key point. My name is Juan Manuel Parra. I'm a scientific officer in the pesticide unit. I'm dealing with uh, several projects in EPSA, including Metapad and Euclid. The main part of this webinar will be given by uh, Richard Konaskit, Rick from UCPA, who will guide you to the main topic of today. So how to enter the data into the uh, composer. And I have also the support from uh, Martina Panzarea that will help me as a moderator in the Q&A uh, session. And from IT support, uh, uh, we have Carla Dallaglio and Alberto Goldoni and also from the events team, Francesco Amoretti. So as you can see from, from the agenda, after each session, we will have a short uh, uh, time for Q&A. This is uh, in any of the sessions uh, of today. And then at the end, the last presentation should be short. So we will have also more time there for further Q&A. Uh, some uh, guide for you. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. The webinar is in English and questions should be submitted in English through this platform. You are automatically connected to the audio broadcast and it's only one way audio. So only listen only mode so we cannot hear you. But then you can submit uh, questions uh, through the this uh, live event Q&A uh, where you have uh, the option to include your name and then your questions. Although it's optional to include your name, we will recommend you uh, to include your name and also your affiliation because this will allow us to frame better uh, your question and of course our reply. We have seen from previous uh, webinars uh, that there are two main types of questions. Some of them uh, might be categorized as procedural questions and some other are scientific, scientific technical questions. For any procedural questions, we invite you, of course, to, to, to ask, but then we will reply to this question afterwards, after the webinar, and we will take into account when finalizing the manual for the DER composer. And we will have to uh, dedicate the time for this webinar to reply to any scientific technical questions in the composer with the help of uh, Rick. So uh, I will start my presentation. Uh, so I will introduce to you the Metapad project. We will go together through three key questions. Why, what and who? Why are we here? According with the European Union data requirements of pesticide metabolism studies are required in several areas. Like in the area of toxicology, when we normally require metabolism studies in the rat, for example, but it might be also in other species, lab species like the dog. And in the area of residues, uh, we require, the legislation requires metabolism data on plants or livestock, and this is depending on the agricultural uses of the pesticides. I can see from the registration list the, that there are some people attending from contract research organization or academia that are responsible for conducting the studies. We have also people from industry mainly agrochemical industry that are responsible for sponsoring the metabolism studies. We have also people from uh, competent authorities 
risk assessors that are in charge of assessing the studies. I can see also from this registration list that there are some people with uh, working in the field of predictive toxicology that might be interesting into how Metapath is working and what kind of prediction can be done and what they will be interested to learn uh, how we can predict the outcome of these studies. And then we have also people from general public that will be interested to see how these studies are assessed by risk assessors. And it's seen that we all have something in common and is that we like metabolism. And at least for me, uh, as a risk assessor, I think that metabolism is one of the key elements to understand toxicology. According with the transparency regulation that amended the food law and entered in force in Europe some weeks ago, some, yes, some weeks ago, EPSA has a new requirement for capturing management, handling and distribution data on plant protection products. It has been decided to use IUCLID that is managed by the, our sister agency, European Chemical Agency, ECA. And furthermore, applicants should provide data on metabolism in the areas of residues and mammalian toxicology. Uh, and they should provide this data by using the Metapath software. But what is Metapath? Metapath stands for Metabolic Pathways, with the main purpose of archiving, sharing, and analyzing experimental data on metabolism, metabolic pathways, and crucial supporting metadata. Metapath also means freely available software. We have two types of software. One with the aim of data analysis, is called Metapath, and one with the aim of data entry, called Composer. These softwares are uh, publicly available and you can download uh, freely from the uh, software developer. I hope that before this meeting, uh, this webinar, you have already downloaded. If not, you can download today or after the webinar. Metapath also means uh, electronic databases. In the area of pesticides, we have two types of uh, electronic databases. The first one is the regulatory legacy collection of maps, and the second one is the EPSA public collection of maps. Further details on these two databases are available in the web page that is shown now on the screen. I uh, put emphasis on the area of pesticides because as Metapath is a freely available software, it can make, uh, you can also make use of this software for analyzing metabolism data coming from other sources, so not only pesticides. And indeed, some of the features of Metapath has been already integrated in the OECD toolbox. Let's see now together in a schematic way the different components met of Metapath and the different actors. So Metapath means uh, experimental data and that are conducted, for example, in the rat or in the gut. And these data, these studies are conducted by CROs or academia. We are going to use uh, the composers for the data entry coming from these studies uh, by using the software called composers. The composers can generate an XML file that will be uh, attached in Euclid and allows then electronic submission of the data to regulatory agencies to EPSA. Then the XML file will populate the database of Metapath where risk assessors can make use of Metapath in order to search, for example, for common metabolites between rats 
and plants or between rats and livestock. You can also search for common metabolites between different pesticide active substances. Uh, you can also compare the uh, metabolic pathway between different species. And we expect that in the future, uh, this database, uh, once it's robust enough, um, can make, we can make use of this database for further um, use for prediction in order to avoid uh, animal testing, for example. So this is one of the goal and in a long term basis. Let's see now an example of Metapad. So the uh, webinar of today is not focused on this uh, data analysis software, it's, it's based on, it's focused on the composer, but let's see one example of Metapad. Uh, so in this case, we have compared the metabolic pathway in the rat and in the goat, and Metapad uh, clearly identify which metabolites are common between a uh, rat and goat and then also identify what which one are not uh, found as common also give you a similarity index between the two maps and we can see from this example that the similarity index between the two maps is 36 percent similar our colleagues of ANSES uh, have been already prepared some Metapad video tutorials that I invite you also to consult this web page and these video tutorials in order to find more uh, tools and more instructions on how to use uh, Metapad. The other software uh, uh, that is the data entry software are called composers. Composers are customized screen editors developed to automate data entry into Metapad while also streamlining the production of agency specific study summaries such as the data evaluation records, DRR, used by the UCPA Office of Pesticides Program. So this is the reason why the one for the rat is called data evaluation record, the ER. Whereas for the residues part and livestock, uh, the composer has been further updated and now it's following a slightly different architecture. This is also the reason why we organized two different sessions. So the one on this composer in the MSS composer has been already taking place. In this website, you will find uh, the webinar recording for these composers. But the uh, when we have today, we'll be focused on the DER, and we have here Rick to explain this. Metapath means also, and this is very important, means also international collaboration. The Metapath user group called MOOC has been uh, managed by the OECD and people from coming from industry, regulatory agencies around the world has joined have joined this um, group. EPSA joined some years ago, but Metapad was born in the USA with the UCPA leadership in collaboration with the software developer LMC, Laboratory of Mathematical Chemistry. And we are very lucky today to have here with us uh, Richard Kolaski, Rick, um, from UCPA in Duluth, who will guide us through uh, the composer. So Rick, the floor is yours, uh, welcome. Thank you, Juan. Um, as, as Juan mentioned, uh, I, am, I am from the uh, US EPA. I'm a research chemist at the uh, Great Lakes Toxicology and Ecology Division in Duluth, Minnesota. Um, as he mentioned, the um, use of the DER composers, uh, their their construction and and a collaborative effort between the US EPA and um, Ovanis McKenyon's group, the Laboratory of Mathematical Chemistry. Uh, it's my pleasure today to present to you uh, some of the inside uh, knowledge and, and use in, in 
performing with these uh, th with this composer. Um, part one will involve opening the DER composer, uh, population of the general info page, and following up with the materials and methods section of the composer. Uh, I'll go through a series of, of screenshots where this is the opening screen of the program. Uh, there are a number of icons across the top, and I, I'll take just a, a, a couple of minutes to illustrate their function. Uh, the folder uh, to the left is the icon to open a previously saved uh, XML file. So you can, uh, by using this software, you can, you can start a project, uh, leave it for a while, come back to it, uh, make modifications to it, uh, the next two icons are uh, in the interest of saving your work to save the XML, the blue icon to save as, which can be uh, very beneficial in if you start to populate uh, something for a goat study, uh, I, I'm sorry, for a, a rat study, and then uh, uh, also there is a, a submitted study for uh, a mouse or a rabbit, you can uh, utilize uh, a good portion of that rat study, which has been populated for those other species. So it's a, a tremendous time saver in the long run. Uh, the next icon over is used to generate a, a Word document, and we will we'll talk about that a little bit later as far as a, a report out feature. Uh, Let's say you start moving through and you populated and you just don't like what you've, you've done, uh, want to start over. This is your icon to do just that. It's to reset the composer. Uh, the uh, next uh, icon is uh, for the option uh, relating to system warnings. Uh, this will open up and uh, I just leave this on the default usually because you want to uh, have a warning there if you've forgotten something. Uh, very important to a lot of these studies are the radio labeled test material. Uh, you need to get that populated or you'll run the risk of not being able to import the, the material into Metapath later on. Uh, a couple of other warnings below. Uh, again, I just uh, will normally just stay with the, the default. Um, one mentioned that this was a initially set up for the uh, mammalian metabolism uh, uh, capture of the admin studies. Uh, there are a couple of icons. Uh, when this composer was constructed, we did not have the MSS uh, livestock composer available to us. So this at that time was our only option to capture both of those studies. So this initial composer served a, a dual purpose. Uh, number one, to capture the, the, as I mentioned before, the rat metabolism or the mammalian metabolism studies, as well as the uh, livestock. Uh, last, the red X is to exit the program. So I mentioned about starting with the general info page. Uh, I've got a lot of, a lot of information on this page. Uh, this is where you begin filling the, the pertinent information. And as such, uh, each of these uh, are designed with a data entry box where you would just proceed through by clicking on the box and, and entering the information. Um, the top part of this involves a bunch of information which you will not really be involved in at all. Uh, Realize that this is a, a very old composer. Um, as far as uh, migration to the the chapter summary, I I would hope in the in the near future that this composer will be upgraded to the chapter summary and more uh, follow that of the the revision of the MSS style. Uh, so we'll we'll forget most of the top the the fields uh, as far as uh, pertaining to US EPA reviewers, TXR, et cetera, et cetera, and just uh, drop down and we'll start working with the appropriate areas. 
Uh, there's a, a section in here where you want to make sure that we're focused on the uh, metabolism for the rat and the appropriate uh, guidelines. This is an OP, um, OPPTS uh, guideline uh, number and uh, the OECD number, the corresponding OECD number. Um, as I mentioned about agency code, there's a, a drop down uh, pick list here. Uh, there are things uh, pertaining to the PC code. There is uh, a room in here for a uh, CAS number. It can be populated. Uh, you could build in an EFSA uh, code number. Um, you can come up with a customized uh, drop down and then fill in that value. Uh, continue through the composer, filling in your your test material. So generally, we've been we've been sticking with a, a common name uh, for that that active ingredient. Uh, a percentage of purity, if available, a UPAC name. Uh, any synonyms? Uh, next uh, would be working through a citation. We want to make sure that we capture the reference. And in doing so, there's a, a little plus icon as you're adding uh, a given reference. Uh, the reference uh, citation box will, will open. You'll be able to populate that information in here. Uh, MRID number, again, is maybe referring to a, a US EPA um, uh, numbering of their system for submitted studies. Uh, I, I guess I, my, my take home for you is, is don't sweat it. You will not be needed to, uh, to populate that value. However, very important, you want to make sure that you check this box to generate tables for that particular reference. Can we have more than one reference? As you can see from the screenshot, I have added uh, several. So uh, multiple references are permissible. OK, so once uh, the citation is is added, you kick, click to generate the tables for the reference. You can move on and uh, the, the tables uh, will be further generated within the, the composer. Uh, as I mentioned before, we we uh, we had two purposes in this first session. One was to capture the general information. Next was uh, materials and methods. And so you would move over to that screen by clicking on the Roman numeral number two for materials and methods. Uh, brings you to the right section. And you, you can begin by filling in uh, a common name for that material with the radio label and location of that label. Uh, add the purity. Uh, specific activity for that radio label and a lot and batch number if, uh, if available. Uh, next, very important is uh, the, the really nice utility about the Metapath program and, and Juan alluded to that in his, his presentation by, by showing some of the functionality of the, the two-dimensional structure. And I, I highlight back to where he did the comparison of the two studies of a, a rat metabolism versus a, a goat residue study. Um, a, a very nice picture. And so how are we going to capture that, that two dimensional uh, structure capability? And there is a, a uh, 2D uh, structure editor associated with this program. So by clicking on the little pen icon, an editor box will open up. And you have the option of filling in the structure by pasting a smile string. Uh, for, I guess, a, a quick explanation of a smile string is it's a, a uh, linear representation of, of characters, of atoms, if you will, and their, their linkage to represent that two-dimensional structure. Um, So as I mentioned before, you can populate by putting the, the smile string into the box and either clicking on the, the draw feature or, or uh, actually using the tools available for the 2D editor. 
and we'll get into the, a little bit of that with the the live demo and uh, and hopefully uh, uh, give you a, a better better understanding of that. So uh, also a spot in here where you can add the the cast number as well. OK, I mentioned about putting in a a, uh, a smile string and where uh, one would go to get such smile strings to represent that that chemical structure. And I found a, a very good uh, uh, website and I I would hope that maybe some of you would be familiar with it. And it's the uh, pesticide properties database uh, uh, affiliated with the University of Hertfordshire. And in here are a, a number of, of uh, uh, pesticides, I guess they're they're separated into insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides. But you can go through and and select the uh, active ingredient of interest, and there's a, a wealth of of some good information in here, as far as as uh, capturing the the smile string and also uh, an IUPAC name or a CAS registration uh, name for a particular active ingredient. So here I, I did just that. So this is a, a representation of a, a smile string for a, a mesotrione is, is this particular uh, active ingredient. Uh, so I, in this screenshot represented that I pasted in went ahead and hit the draw function if it didn't already populate for you. And here is that two dimensional uh, structure that I, I spoke of earlier. So radio labeling of atoms. Um, as you observe in this, this structure, there is no indication of where a radio label might be. Uh, so in, in doing so, uh, the process would be to uh, click on this. It's actually uh, somewhat of an atom type or a, a molecular structure uh, icon. So you, you would click on that and a periodic table would present itself. And so what you would need to do is click down here because we're going to uh, add a, a radio label. Uh, uh, C14 label, so we put the number 14 in here. Click on the carbon atom, and it it shows the selected element would be uh, carbon with the label 14. Go back to our smile string or our structure, and go around and click on the uh, aromatic group of the structure on each carbon and it would change that carbon to a C14 label. And as you do so, that same radio labeling manifests itself within that smile string. So you, you'll see that there's a uh, LBL for that label 14 included into that smile string. Uh, accept that change and the 2D structure is presented within the uh, population of, of that, that screen. Move on to uh, the non-radio label test material. So you click on the icon to open the structure drawing window, just as we did in the, in the previous screen for the radio label material. And we could go through our, our copy and paste uh, copy and paste feature again, where we imported the smile string from our website and accept that. Also fill in the appropriate uh, non-radio labeled test material, uh, any description of that material, uh, lot number, purity, uh, any contaminants found, and lastly, the, the cast number. Uh, I should mention to you too that you do the best you can, fill in the appropriate material. Uh, I believe there will be a guidance uh, document forthcoming that will 
detail and illustrate which features we need as a minimum for capture into Metapath of the selected studies. So I scrolled down and moved to three for test animals. And in this case, it was a, a rat. And I, I want to caution you that we're going to stay with a very simplified uh, form of the species uh, within this section. So we don't want anything like sprague dolly rat, uh, male rat, uh, big white rat, uh, any such thing. Just keep it simple with rat. Uh, moves on, as this was mentioned before, uh, for the capture of mammalian studies. So we could have mouse in here. We could have rabbit. We could have uh, guinea pig as far as uh, other species to consider. Uh, fill in the, the strain of that species. Uh, generally an age, seven to nine weeks. Weight of the animals. Uh, source, if available. Any housing requirements, if they were in the same cage, if they were in uh, stainless steel metabolism cages. Uh, what diet was fed? If it was a pelleted rat chow, um, as far as ad, ad libidum, and uh, likewise the water. Uh, any temperature that was reported, humidity, air exchange issues, uh, photo period, and an acclimation period. All spots within the composer for capture of said information. Uh, down below, a prep, an area for a narrative section for preparation of dosing solutions. Um, again, uh, a spot for it in here, how that dose was prepared. Uh, let's maybe move to a, a live demo and uh, actually start working with the program and show you a little bit about um, how this works. So I, I had an icon on my desktop. This is the live program that we are seeing, so we can move from screens. But we will we'll start with the general info. As I mentioned before, this was a dual use composer. Right now it is clicked on for the, the livestock. Uh, another, another feature as you move across these icons, it will briefly open up for you and, and show you a descriptor. So here were those saves uh, functions that I had mentioned before. But what we want to do is make sure that we're uh, on the mammalian or the rat style composer. There are some slight differences here. And uh, a good key for this and a key point is look below that your study type is, is showing metabolism in the rat. So again, if I were on the goat, we would get the nature of the residues in the animal, the lactating goat. Um, Again, we want to be on the rat metabolism guideline. Uh, I mentioned before about the agency code. So it, it's currently sitting on US EPA PC code. I'm going to go ahead and enter that. And we could type in the PC code for this, 122.990. And this uh, per pertains to mesotrione, going to be the active in ingredient that I'm going to uh, populate in the composer today. Uh, as I mentioned, there are some other drop down features. PMRA for our colleagues in Canada, a spot for an EFSA number, Australian code if there is one. Uh, let's go ahead and grab CAS number. Again, hit the red down arrow to populate that. And we'll put the CAS number in 104, 206, 82, 8. And moving down to the test material, I'm going to go ahead and populate the mesotrione as our, our test our, our uh, test material. Test material purity, uh, let's just go with 99.7%. IUPAC name. Now here is the there's value in in going out to the website. Um, for the, again, I, I had mentioned about the pesticide properties database. Uh, if we scroll down below,
Oh. Sorry about that. We can go ahead and copy the IUPAC name. Go back to our composer. And I'm I'm performing a right hand click. And paste that information right in. Synonyms, uh, I'm going to leave that blank for now. Uh, end use product, you know, if if was available, you could put that in. Um, Now I'd mentioned before about the citation editor. Uh, very important that we set the the information. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take credit for this one. And we'll follow up with a, a date here. Uh, let's say we did this study in 2012. And this is uh, Metabolism of mesotrione in the rat. Uh, maybe just unpublished study. And there were 230 pages. Uh, no MRID number for this. Uh, remember, another stress point was to generate the, the tables for this reference and then go ahead and submit. So as you see, there is that, that reference populated. And we'll go ahead and stay with that uh, area down here where a, a sponsor is involved. We can, we can probably skip that. Uh, areas in here, if an executive summary were found. So you, uh, a person could go back and if there were uh, paragraphs where that study was was uh, uh, summarized, you could you could copy and paste that information in here. These are our text blocks for capturing that information. But basically we we've set the groundwork and our are moving forward as as far as uh, populating the composer. Uh, we'll move on to the materials and methods section. Now over here, uh, we'll just dive right in and and start drawing that structure, that initial structure. So I've opened the 2D editor, but now I'm going to uh, jump away a little bit to our our properties. Now this is uh, the information for mesotrione. Now I mentioned to you about a, a good source for grabbing the smiles or that representation of the structure. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy that smile string from the website just as a time saver and put that back into the composer. And it auto populated for me. So this was the mesotrion structure. Now we're not done yet because this is the radio label test material. So we'll go up to our icon for opening the periodic table. I mentioned before we want to put in a, a carbon 14 label. Click on carbon and it populates the selected element as such. And we're, are we satisfied with that? I would say yes. Click that, move around to the atoms in that aromatic ring of the structure. And you'll notice up above on the blue bar that our, our smile string has indeed been altered by in inclusion of those labels. And we went ahead and accepted that. As far as radio label test material, 
Uh, let's go ahead and, and populate something in here, you know, a 14 uh, carbon label. We could even specify that as far as the aromatic ring, you know, for the location. And again, mesotrione. Uh, purity of our, our radio label, 98.3%. Uh, um, specific activity, well, let's just pick some numbers. Uh, units, make sure you specify on the units. Uh, and a lot, our batch number. So we finished that. If your particular study included a, a secondary label, say if there was uh, on the on the alternate ring, if there was another label, we have the ability to add a, a second label. Uh, you would just go up to the add function here and include a, a second label within the stu within that study. Um, for now, we'll just oops, sorry. We'll just move down to the non-radio label test material. Again, go to our structure drawing package, and I should still have that on as that smile string on my paste it in, and here's our structure. We're done. So uh, there are a number of shortcuts and time savers that we can go about working with. Uh, as far as the non-radio label, let's just include mesotrione. Uh, description, let's say uh, tan solid. Again, just just uh, moving from box to box, filling in. And purity of this might be 97%. Contaminants. On, um, that cast number, 104, 206, 82. Eight. Now, originally in this design, it was uh, it followed more of a, a template that would capture physical chemical properties. Uh, feel free to populate those if you will. Might be something such as a uh, melting point, uh, a log KOW, or uh, uh, um, solubility parameters. Uh, again, not a big deal, might not be detailed within what is expected to be captured by this exercise. Uh, I'd like to maybe just move down and we'll we'll work on that, that test animal, uh, test species section. Uh, species currently, but the default in here was, was goat for whatever reason. Uh, there's a drop down menu where there are some uh, selectable items, uh, goat, hen, cow, Again, this was a dual purpose composer at one time to capture these livestock species, but certainly there's a rat, the dog. Uh, you could populate this with mouse, as I mentioned before, rabbit. Uh, we're just gonna go ahead and stay consistent with the rat. Uh, let's just pick a species here, maybe Sprague Dolly for purposes. Uh, age at initiation, let's say uh, you can you can put in uh, a single value if it was eight weeks or a range of values. So eight to ten weeks. Likewise for the the weight at the initiation of the study, uh, we could put in a, a single value or we can uh, include a range of values here as well. And we'll just, you know, stay with grams. Uh, source was uh, oh, let's uh, the Acme rat company. Housing, uh, let's say Single animal uh, 
Stainless steel metabolism cage. Diet. Irina Ratchow. Uh, tap water. Temperature value, 21 degrees, humidity, 50%, air changes, uh, 12 per hour. Photo period, uh, maybe 12, 12, 12 light, 12 dark. Acclimation period, we gave the animals four days. Uh, here was that section where you could uh, provide the preparation of the, the dosing solution, type in a narrative in this section, and, and fill in. I believe that's what I had for the, the opening uh, presentation. I'm going to go back to And I think we are going to turn this over and, and take a, a brief break in here for uh, Martina to, to uh, bring up if there are any questions or answers. Yes, Rick, thanks a lot. We received a lot of questions during your presentation. Let me share my screen with the question. We highlighted some for you. So, we have this question about the general info. Um, they are asking if uh, open to destructor editor means free tools integrated into the Metapath program supply and if only CAS be inserted, is it enough to have comprehensive data on all molecule properties? We drafted the reply, so uh, we drafted this reply. Yes, free tool structure identification is coming from the experimental study, and the cast number might not be available for all metabolites. So, if you want to add something to this, uh, I'm I'm not sure I fully understand the. Very tool into the metapath. Let's be inserted. Well, you're, we, we've chosen a cast number because it's very specific to that, that structure. Um, yeah. Again, I'm not sure. OK, we can pass to the other question maybe this is uh, um, about the isomer so how okay. to deal with isomer yes uh, within the the uh, structure drawing package okay I think if well there are within the drawing tools uh, there are our features as far as and I didn't get into too much of the, the drawing package at this point in time, but there are features for uh, drawing the stereoisomers in that you can uh, project bonds coming out of the plane or into the plane. So you could, you could uh, discern between an R or an S configuration. Likewise, if you had the situation where you had a double bond and you were looking at cis trans isomers, there is the capability of, of capturing that information as well. So again, it's it's built within the drawing program. Okay, perfect. And then we have also this question. 
how can I add a new species to point three if I have only three species? I don't know if I understand well the oh. quest. It, there's dual functionality under the species whereby uh, I had demonstrated and shown the drop down menu where I believe there were five species listed. You also have the capability of of typing in a new species, if you will. So that it's fully capable within the program. OK. So maybe that's if, if you would like, I could go back and and uh, share the program and maybe demonstrate a couple of those. I think yeah. we've got time. Yes, I think so, Rick. So if uh, there is uh, still some time, so if you can, if you would sure. like to to open, yes, I think that it will be useful. So what I what I had done is I, I I'll go back, go back to RAT, and and demonstrate that what we we can do is move the cursor over under species, add the mouse, done. Uh, if we could think of any other species, uh, rabbit, freely available. Uh, this is a, a fully editable uh, species box. Let's go back to the 2D editor. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and clear this out. Oops. Sorry about that. Used a, a scissors function. Again, I I feel I'm getting a little ahead of the game here, but but it's it's probably so working through the some of the drawing utilities, I'm just going to draw a quick, uh, simple structure with, with maybe some different functionalities off of that carbon atom. Uh, let's put a fluorine group. So again, I went to the periodic table, selected an element, uh, go back to the periodic table. Let's put a, a bromine. As selected element, yes. So, within this structure, what I have available is a, a carbon center with, as you would agree, four different uh, functional groups or atoms off of that an oxygen, a bromine, a fluorine, and another carbon. So, if we wanted to represent a, a couple of isomers, we have the ability to select different bonds, single, double, aromatic, triple, plane up or plane down. So plane up, we would utilize plane down. There would be uh, stereo structure and denoted within the smile string that's captured with a, uh, a a p here a p minus or a p plus for the other isomer so if i were to go through and draw the other isomer for this uh, likewise i had mentioned about using a, a cis trans feature again i'll go back to the drawing Oops, I, it's currently on plane down. No worries, we can always change that to a the double bond as I had mentioned. And I'm just going to change a couple of these. So in this case, it would be the trans version of this.
in the cis structure. Okay, uh, Martina, did we, do we have any more? Uh, no, I think that uh, we replied to a uh, few of them. Uh, the, the other will be replied after the webinar, so we can go so, ahead. Yeah, but perhaps, uh, yes, um, uh, to ask one second, uh, because the, the, the question regarding the CAS uh, oh. number, we didn't uh, understood uh, very well, so I would like to ask one second uh, who to Anna Blagigaya, if uh, you can uh, please um, uh, formulate again this question because we didn't uh, get uh, very well what you are asking uh, regarding the cast number. So the comment regarding and if only cas be inserted is enough to have comprehensive data and of molecule properties. So you can reformulate this question, so we could try to address later on, but uh, we didn't really get um, uh, what you are asking. So now, I, Rick, you can continue. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I, I'm really wondering if if maybe that individual was was getting at if if by just plugging in the cast number, we would automatically get the, the physical properties and that that is not the case. Uh, the, the program won't do that for you. Uh, these these physical chemical properties that I, I briefly went through uh, would be populated by by the user and not necessarily be automatically populated. So if that's what you're referring to or if I, I misunderstood, again, I, I echo Juan's comment that it would be nice to to receive a little clarification on that. All right, I'm going to go ahead and move right into the next section. Uh, part two. Uh, uh, Rick, I've, I've, sorry to interrupt you. So perhaps also for, yeah. for the screen, if you can, um, because now on the screen I can see the presentation and also my face. So if you can don't, uh, the, if you can close the, the window regarding the my, my face so we can see the presentation better. Oh. Okay, minimize. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you, Juan. Okay, so we'll move move forward uh, with with part two of the presentation, uh, the appendix one, appendix two, and the implications back to material methods and and study design. So I I mentioned before about moving through. Uh, the population of the composer. So we started with general info, the Roman numeral one, Roman numeral two, materials and methods. But before we, we move on to the results or certainly any discussion or conclusion uh, information, uh, we need to move to the appendix. So they're a, a little bit out of, out of order, but it's necessary to to lay down the groundwork on how the, the study was, was conducted. And basically what these appendix do are they, they capture the relevant information of that study. And furthermore, appendix one serves to break down uh, each of those, those treatment groups, what we're calling treatment groups. And it, it looks at the test and breaks it down into the lowest compartment where you might hope to find a given metabolite. So in defining a treatment group, you'd be talking about uh, gender, for example, male rats versus female rats. Uh, it could potentially be age, you know, so if you had uh, mature versus juvenile rats, uh, dose amount, dose amount could be uh, uh, a, a low dose of one part per million, and then in that, that same uh, study or, or manuscript, there was a, a, another set of rats that were exposed to 100 part per million. Those would be two separate treatment groups. 
another variable could be dose route. That could be either oral administration of the uh, test material, or it could be uh, intravenous or in, in inhalation. Uh, next would be the sample matrix. Sample matrix I would refer to uh, if excretia were collected, if urine, for example, or feces or bile, or uh, a sample matrix could very well be uh, various tissues, could be the liver, could be looking at the kidney, uh, at plasma, et cetera, et cetera. So what you've done is you've laid out all of these variables as, as experimental descriptors, and then each would be uh, working within each other to lay out a specific treatment group. So for example, you could have male, uh, high dose, 100 part per million, uh, oral, and uh, urine for a, a specific treatment group. So in laying out in, in, I guess it's a bit of dissection that you go through of, of that study into those, those various uh, groups, you lay the foundation uh, for uh, description within Metapath. So to bring up a test group, you click on the plus icon to add a new and an appendix, uh, one editor comes up. So you can define a, a test number as 1A or you could use a, a number of descriptors. So if you wanted to include a, a more graphic or more descriptive uh, test descriptor in here, you, you could certainly do so. Uh, you have the option of selecting either male or female or non-reported if they just didn't report that in the study. The number of animals, dose route I mentioned, uh, concentration of, of the dose in, in both terms of nominal or a measured value. Uh, matrix that I mentioned before. Uh, this could be urine, it could be feces, it could be bile, it could be a tissue. And test duration. Any other experimental descriptors for capture? Uh, dose type, certainly if it was single or if it was multiple over 14 days. And any remarks? You go ahead and, and click Submit. And in this screen, I've listed a number of treatment groups that were established and built within the system. So as you can see in, in the column under sex, under gender, uh, there are a number of females and males are separated. Uh, they all happen to be oral uh, dose route, uh, two different concentrations, and both nominal and measured values. The dose type, the single, test duration, the matrix, urine, feces, bile, et cetera, et cetera, and any remarks if they were pooled samples uh, or used solely as a source, uh, all of that material gets captured. So I want to uh, bring you back to uh, materials and methods. There was a, a second tab that we didn't necessarily focus on in the in the introduction in the first uh, section of this presentation. We dealt with A, the materials, and that's where we put the uh, radio label test material, the non radio label test material, and the, the species, the test species. Uh, there was a second tab to that B, the study design and methods. And this is where details of the group arrangements um, are, are captured in this table. And you don't need to worry about any of this. This was all auto populated for you by using the appendix one that we just created. So a lot of that information is captured over um, as a redundancy uh, within the system. Uh, likewise, there was a, a, a second uh, table, table two within, and, and this is to bring you into, into frame that we were talking about the materials and methods. So again, information that came from the appendix, fed back into materials and methods, 
under the B tab, the study design and methods. This is the, the second table where those treatment groups are, are grouped together in order of the matrix. And you could fill in uh, and populate information in here uh, as far as the, the sample time and the uh, major method. You know, so if it was an extraction, uh, conjugate analysis, if that was done, um, and your analytical tools that were used. Um, I found this beneficial when it eventually gets into Metapath and say there are two identical reports for a given active ingredient. And I'm, I'm just going to uh, go off chart here a little bit and talk about this. Uh, now, in my in my example, there were two studies of the rat in uh, tebuconazole. And one of those studies gave 15 metabolites, but the second one only gave us four metabolites. Now, what was the difference here? They were both rat studies. They were both done by guideline methods, but there's a, a discrepancy in the, the report of the authors on those met metabolites that were found. And so you could go back and look at the anal analytical detection methods. So in the study with 15 metabolites, we find that they were done by a GC mass spec or LC mass spec. And in the second study, they might have been done by a uh, thin layer chromatography where you just looked at the spots on the on the on the profile. And so I think analytical method plays an important part in trying to sort out any discrepancies within those studies. So um, an important area for for capture of information. All right, moving back to the uh, appendices. Uh, we we finished population of Appendix 1A where we laid out the treatment groups. We're moving on to Appendix 2 and this is where the structures of the parent chemical and the metabolites will be entered. And in doing so, the, the first step you'll go through is to click on the plus icon to add the parent. Can also be done to add metabolites, but we always want to start with the parent chemical. Uh, for whatever reason, I've had folks in the past work and start adding metabolites right away, and it it messes things up in the in the uh, editor itself. So uh, always start with the parent chemical. That's another one of Rick's handy uh, tricks of the trade to stay with. Uh, once you click on that plus icon, an Appendix 2 editor will come up and you can provide a common name for that metabolite or a more detailed elaborate chemical name for that, that parent or metabolite. Uh, you have access to a, a structure uh, drawing editor again. And we'll we'll get into some of that in the demonstration. Uh, and lastly, I think I want to maybe uh, focus a bit on the expertise section. So you have the capability of of adding some significance to that metabolite within your metabolite tree. Uh, there's an area where you can check assume by author, and what that represents is that if there were an intermediate that was drawn, and in most cases I, I will say drawn because a lot of these, these studies are mapped out and they'll give a proposed metabolic map. So that's all basically we're doing in this section is copying that proposed map. And a lot of the authorship will propose an intermediate. And by that I mean something that's not er experimentally found within the study so that they didn't find any of the intermediate but they know well very well that it it had to be there or they're proposing that it was there uh, an example might be if you started out with an alcohol and you you found that in the study certainly but then you found a carboxylic acid but logic would tell you there was an intermediate of going through in that oxidation process 
going through to an aldehyde. The aldehyde wasn't necessarily found in the study. They didn't find evidence of the aldehyde in the urine or the feces or the bile, but they proposed that it was there as an intermediate en route from the alcohol to the carboxylic acid. There's an area where you can expertly specify where a group might be. So I don't know if, if many of you have seen a structure where it was uh, a ring substitution example for uh, where they mentioned that uh, the ring was, was hydroxylated, but they didn't specify on what position, if it was in an ortho or a para or a meta position for that matter. But an expert could come in and say, well, what is the most likely position for it to be? It would go in the para position. There's less steric hindrance. And, and write that down. Uh, include that. So you would click this box. If it were not expertly specified within the study, put down who the expert was. You know, if, if you're the expert and you're making that, that decision on that structure, put down that decision that uh, the para position was favored in my brief example. There's a, a couple of spots where you can you can highlight that given metabolite um, as as far as being part of the tolerance expression or as a residue of concern. So uh, you have some flexibility in here as far as uh, adding some expertise as we're building our our metabolite table. So on this screen, you know, again we've hit the 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 plus icon here. The 2D editor came up. We can go ahead and paste in that smile string, or if you prefer to use the drawing package, you can draw this, this structure, and then hit OK. Uh, the chemical structure will be represented both by a two-dimensional picture as well as a smile string. Uh, lastly, to finish off the, the parent chemical, uh, add mesotrione, uh, mesotrione as well as a uh, uh, chemical company uh, short list or a short name for for that that structure. Next would be just to continue with daughters that came from the parent chemical and then eventually granddaughters. So you would build a very uh, uh, detailed map of the metabolic processes that went on within the study. Um, I personally have seen maps as simple as uh, what you see before you. You know, you may encounter a, a, an active ingredient that will not metabolize at all. So a very simple and the simplest of all maps is to include just parent chemical. Uh, I've, I've also seen where you only have a single or or two metabolite structures coming off of parent, or you could have as many as 60 or 70. Yes, that's six zero or seven zero metabolites off of a, a very detailed structure. Uh, so again, moving forward uh, for the next structure within the metabolic map, this would be, uh, Referring back, so we have the initial, it's kind of hidden underneath this in this screenshot, the parent chemical, but we're going to add a metabolite now. So the same process that we went through to add the parent chemical, we would follow through with the uh, metabolites as well. So go back, hit the uh, little pen icon, and it will bring up the 2D editor. Now in this case, what I've done is I've I've pasted in uh, the parent smile string. We have that freely available. Uh, not only is it on that uh, PPDB website, but we've used it several times in the composer already. So we use that smile string to populate the non-radio label test material, the radio label test material, and we just put it into appendix two as the parent chemical. So what I've done is added that to begin work on our, our metabolite. 
Uh, you'll find that in looking at metabolic transformations, generally it's it's just a an alteration of maybe one spot or one site within the parent chemical that things are changed. So um, start out by adding that parent structure in here. And in this case, in my example, I'm going to form the metabolite 5 hydroxy mesotrione. So what we're going to involve is just a hydroxylation of the of the parent chemical in the uh, five position, five position. I'm sorry, I'm looking at this and that that might actually be the four position of the mesotrione uh, dione ring. But to get started, uh, you go back to click on the blue pen icon and draw a bond from that, that ring structure. So again, I'll refer you back to that, that parent. What we're going to do is uh, add hydroxylation in this position. And so again, to recap, draw that bond out but we're not done there because by default this is a carbon atom and we need to change it to an oxygen. So we'll cover that in the next screen. We'll go back to the, uh, as you can see, we've added that carbon atom off of that ring, but again, we're not finished yet. Go back to that periodic table icon with the um, blue circle with the two yellow circles to represent a uh, molecular structure. In this case, what we'll do is go up to the oxygen on the periodic table, click on that. Always look below. That'll tell you what your selected element is. In this case, oxygen. Hit yes to accept the change. Go back over that atom, click on it to accept the change, and it changed it from an, a carbon to an oxygen. And we now have that uh, metabolite available to us. Uh, by closing the box, it's been accepted. The new smile string is in, the two-dimensional structure, the, the uh, name for this, 5-hydroxy uh, mesotrione. Uh, any expertise? None. We didn't need to add any for this particular one. But I'll, I'll have you focus on I guess it's maybe about the third section of the four uh, where we detail as far as parents. And this is uh, important in drawing that metabolic tree in that you identify where this particular metabolite came from. And by clicking the box on the mesotrione parent chemical, it tells you that it came from a transformation, a direct transformation from parent chemical to this metabolite. Now I've gone ahead and added uh, in this screenshot, built a, a table of, of metabolites. So I've just repeated the process that I illustrated above, uh, starting with mesotrione. We added a 5-hydroxy metabolite. We had a 4-hydroxy, um, the uh, two other metabolites and an intermediate. Now there are some uh, drawing tools maybe or, or editing tools for this particular table uh, that we should make mention of. Uh, we already mentioned about the plus icon being able to add an additional row, but let's say we wanted to insert a row in between two. So if we wanted to add a metabolite in between two and three, we move our cursor to three and then use this icon for uh, inserting a row into a specific location. The, uh, this looks like a chalkboard eraser, if you will, but that's to delete a row. So say we've made a mistake or no longer want a metabolite in our map, we will, uh, we will uh, eliminate such by using the delete icon. Uh, this button, this uh, I guess a little spyglass or, or work uh, icon is to uh, um, 
edit an existing row. So say we want to open up the, the structure drawing editor. Uh, later on, we found it within our map that we had a uh, structure that was drawn wrong or needed to be modified. You can certainly go back and uh, edit or work on that particular structure. Uh, then there's uh, this option of moving from a tree view to a list. Uh, this doesn't really pertain to, to most of the metabolism studies for mammalian species, as most of those maps are going to be proposed for you. They're going to be drawn out. But in the case of environmental degradate samples, a lot of times they don't draw a tree. They'll just list environmental degradates. So that's why this, this feature was built into the composer in, in the list setting. But for now, we'll just we'll stay with the tree view. So uh, we see before us that again that completed appendix two. It's a metabolite inventory table with uh, a structure ID number. Uh, name, smiles, and connectivity to reproduce that given map. Uh, I want to go back and maybe maybe illustrate one point where we had an intermediate structure drawn in five, and it's exactly that I, I mentioned before when I started talking about the expertise that can be applied. And in this particular study, it was not actually found in any of the matrix that were sampled, but more of a proposed or an assumed by author metabolite within the system. So we went back and we checked that. So uh, in the process of this, now on the last screen, we had completed our table of metabolites, and then we started to look at the results of the experiment. And we found that, oh, the intermediate was not found. Let's go back and add assume by author. So we hit the uh, little, um, what looks like a spyglass on a paper uh, icon to bring up the appendix two editor. And we're going back in and making our change to add assume by author to that. Again, this was, uh, other uh, another note on on expertise. Uh, feel free, you can go back to that those sections in in uh, under Roman numeral two under the materials and methods, the study design, uh, add text information if if available. But uh, generally, for purposes of of using this tool as uh, consumption into Metapath. That, that text information is not captured, but uh, I, I'm assuming that details will be forthcoming as far as which are the pertinent and relevant uh, data fields to capture. Uh, again, just some more about going back and revisiting uh, that, that table two on, under the appendix uh, that was auto-populated from the appendix. Uh, by clicking on the little icon, you can always pull up a, a table two editor. Uh, I fear that I might have lost some of you folks. Again, we're focusing back on information that was added by the appendix, back to the materials and methods under section B, the study design and methods. So again, you know, it's how do I add the analytical separation tools, the analytical detection? You can go back and, and add that information. Uh, again, some areas for adding uh, additional text. And I guess let's go back to the uh, live editor and let's start playing with uh, the appendix. Oh, I'm too far here. So we'll go back to our live demonstration, the actual software. So we finished up under materials and methods. Let's move on to the appendix. Now I mentioned about adding treatment groups and we'll click on the plus sign for the editor. And for this, I'm gonna be a little more descriptive. I'm gonna put M for male 
And I'm going to put. Oops. LO for low dose. And we'll look in urine. So male. Number of animals five. Dose route, uh, dose route oral. Nominal dose here was uh, one one part per million or a milligram per kilogram. But in the interest of science, we actually measured the me measured the dose. Matrix, we're going to go ahead and put urine in here. And test duration, uh, let's say it was a four day study, 96 hours. Experimental descriptors, I'm not going to add anything, but this would be our, our first entry. And you have the flexibility of opening this up so you can uh, marginalize your, your, your columns uh, so you can see what, what is happening. So we've got one, one treatment group has been added. Uh, let's go ahead and add another. And the nice thing about the uh, composer is that it comes pre-populated with the last item that you put in here. So uh, assuming that it was that same group of, of rats, so let's add feces as far as a component or a compartment. Change the matrix and we should be done. So although things appear a little cumbersome as far as having to, you, you think to yourself, oh, I've got to add all of these treatment groups, but, but certainly there are some shortcuts that you can work with. So again, the dose was all the same, the number of animals, the dose route, all of that information um, stayed the same. The only thing that changed was the matrix. So we'll go ahead and add that. Um, we can continue adding treatment groups. Let's say in this case, uh, the female, we want to change, certainly change that as far as our gender. Uh, matrix is still okay because we've got feces, uh, but in this case it was 1.01 .01 was the measure, measured concentration for that the, those female rats. Go ahead and submit. And we say, oh, well, I wish I'd have had uh, the urine in here because I want to go male, low dose, urine, male, low dose, feces. Really would have been great to have female in here. So you have the ability to uh, select this icon to insert a row before the selected. So move your cursor down to feces because we want to put a row in between here. Click on this, comes pre-populated. What we can do at this point is just change this to urine. Change urine over here. And boom, we've inserted that treatment group. So we'll go back and we'll just continue through. Uh, let's change this to a high dose. Uh, oral, let's say in this case, we, they wanted uh, 50 milligram per kilogram. And 49.8 was a measured value. Uh, urine is the same. Go ahead and add that. Uh, again, in this instance, just for uh, purposes. Male. Uh, let's say this was all the same as far as the dose. So what I'm I'm just trying to build here is is uh, uh, male and female rats at a low dose and a high dose and looking at two compartments or two two matrix either in the urine or the feces so we've got male low dose urine male low dose feces female low dose urine female low dose feces 
male high dose urine, male high dose feces, uh, the female, and all we need now is uh, is the uh, another female feces, and that was added. So uh, again, you could run into a number of different dose routes. Uh, there could be an IV intravenous, like I mentioned before in the presentation. Uh, you could certainly run into uh, additional bile studies that were done or some studies that were done to capture specific uh, compartments pertaining to tissues. So for now, uh, we're done. We've pretty much populated uh, in our, our quick and dirty example here on how to populate the uh, Appendix 1. It didn't, didn't take us a great deal of time to do this. Uh, we'll move on to Appendix 2. And in this case, uh, we want to add that parent chemical. I wonder if I still have that on my. Yes, I do still have it. On my uh, my pad. So this was the parent structure for mesotrione. Went ahead and added that uh, chemical name. Try on. Now let's say we wanted to uh, invoke that IUPAC name here. So for now, we could go ahead and submit this. Let's go back to our um, general info page. Here was the IUPAC name, so we can certainly go back here, copy, move back to the appendix, reopen this. Add that chemical name. So we have both the common name for the active ingredient as well as the uh, IUPAC chemical name. So that is done. All right. Uh, let's move on to adding some metabolites. Uh, first thing I want to do is on my package. I, you know, remember I had gone out and I did a copy and paste. So I, I currently have this on my on my uh, on notepad, if you will. Uh, we'll go back and reestablish this. So by doing a right hand click, again, I just hit the right hand of the mouse. And you can either copy the picture if you wanted to do that for a presentation, or you could copy that smile string. We're going to copy the smile string at this point, and then. Go ahead and, and close that box. We're going to add a metabolite. So again, open our structure editor, our 2D editor. Paste in that metabolite. And let's add the 4-hydroxy. Uh, so up to the pen. Draw in an initial bond, a single bond. Now there's a, a couple of shortcuts here. I could take you back through the route of opening the periodic table. Or there's the shortcut where you have uh, these available for element change, for atom change. So it's currently residing on the oxygen. So we'll click on that and we can change the oxygen. So there's a number of, of shortcuts and nuances involved in the 2D editor as well. But this basically gets us to the structure for the, the 4-hydroxy. So click Accept, adds it in. Uh, for here, we'll just uh, and I goof that up, 4-hydroxy. Go so down here for purposes. We'll just put 4 hydroxy so try on. Uh, what we know from our, our our metabolic tree, and when I'm mentioning this, 
Now this, I've got an actual data evaluation record for mesotrione, and I'm not revealing any company secrets because the, the source of this was a FOIA document under the Freedom of Information Act. This was released so that anybody can get at this information. It's been sanitized through the system. But what I want to point out and just maybe give you a, a quick picture is uh, what I'm getting at when they talk about a proposed metabolic pathway within a number of these studies. Uh, this is what we're really trying to duplicate within the, the, uh, the appendix two. So you have parent chemical going to a number of metabolites. Uh, there's an intermediate within this and then a, a granddaughter, if you will. So we'll go back to our, our drawing feature and from that, that uh, diagram or that proposed metabolic tree, the 4-hydroxy came from the, the parent chemical, the mesotrione itself. So we went ahead and clicked that and submit. Uh, likewise, we can, we can continue adding. So we're adding another metabolite at this point. Go back, same process, click on the drawing package. The shortcut is always to use that parent structure. And in this case, we're going to add the 5-hydroxy metabolite. Again, those steps, that didn't take quite right. So if you make a mistake, you wanna move back, you have the option of hitting the back arrow. Again, click on the oxygen. And affect your change. Go ahead and accept. Now in this case, we had the Hydroxy. Want to elaborate? Five hydroxy mesotrione. And this also came from the parent chemical. So we're not going to click all of these, mind you, because the five hydroxy certainly did not come from the four hydroxy in our metabolic tree. And uh, Nothing to add as far as expertise, so we'll go ahead and submit to accept that. And uh, just just continuing through. I'm going to add an intermediate whereby this intermediate was uh, a reduction of the nitro group to an amine. So to change that, we'll just use the scissors. Again, it's just uh, most of these are just alteration of the parent structure or a uh, precursor. So we'll go ahead and accept this. And for now, we'll just call it intermediate. And it came, it too came from just the parent chemical. But in this case, we're going to add assumed by author because it wasn't really measured within the study, but the authors are assuming it to be there within that, that uh, um, proposed metabolic tree. Okay, so uh, again, process running through is go back so it it's there are some shortcuts what i really want to lay out and illustrate to you is that there are shortcuts in in drawing these uh these metabolites now in this case what we're going to do is uh modify this uh, i'm using the scissors function to delete and effect an atom change in here as a carboxylic acid and so what i've i've drawn here is uh another metabolite found within that tree and this was just uh labeled as mnba
and it too came from the the parent chemical, the mesotrione. Uh, I don't have any expertise to add for that, so we'll go ahead and submit. We're almost done with our appendix. So I'm going to add one more structure to complete. So again, go back to the parent. So it's just a matter of copying, you know, a right hand click, pasting in that smile string and it draws the two dimensional structure. Again, we're going to make some modification to this. Uh, use the scissors, cut out some of these atoms that we want to get rid of. Modification here. And here. So we'll go ahead and accept. And this happens to be the structure AMBA in this particular. So you can run into some very well defined. Um, names for the metabolites, but um, in this case, just just some letters to represent this particular structure. Uh, and this came from uh, MNBA. So what happened is, uh, what this signified is a reduction. So this structure was basically formed. Well, I'll, let me take a step back and, and add the, the, uh, the linkage here as far as the parent structure and then I'll bring everything back into view for you. Uh, so it also came from the intermediate, so you can certainly have uh, two sources of a given metabolite. So again, we'll maybe just recap and, and lay out what we had happening here. So we can go back, look at the mesotrione, and within here, and you have the ability to blow this up a little bit bigger, rotate it around for view, but mesotrione is here. So the initial metabolic reactions are going to be hydroxylation. So there'll be a, a five hydroxylation and a four hydroxylation apparent. And those are illustrated here is the five hydroxy. Here is the four hydroxy. There was also this intermediate formed where what happened, this used to be a nitro group on here. It was reduced to a, an amine functionality, NH2. The other route was the, the cleavage of that, that secondary ring. The, the dione ring was now cleaved off of the parent structure to give rise to the MNBA. And then lastly, I want to point out is when it was cleaved, this nitro group that used to be on here is now reduced. So there's the, the clear pathways are laid out within the appendix. OK, I think uh, I think that brings us to another uh, question and answer break. And so I'll, I'll turn it back over to Martina if we have anything yes. uh, from our viewers that we need to discuss. Yes, actually, we had a lot of question about this structure. So let me read them. Here, a lot of question about uh, how to handle generic structure. And uh, uh, for instance, if the position of the oxidation has several possibilities. And also here, the same question was raised. So about the hydroxidation and the, uh, if uh, you don't know the excess structure of the metabolites. Right. So, uh, where I view is a couple of examples you could use and I mentioned about the expertise section. You could, you could uh, give as an example one of the structures. And I, 
I think a good example is what we just we just faced was in the case of a uh, uh, hydroxylation in the four position as well as the five position in the dione ring of mesotrione. Uh, if I were populating that and they just simply said uh, and uh, hydroxylation of the ring, uh, I could take two approaches. One would be to pick the most logical would be the 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 five hydroxy position uh, and and state that and I'm saying that because it would be uh, less sterically hindered by the uh, carbonyl groups off of that ring. Uh, another approach would be to simply draw both structures, include all positions in your drawing. Okay, very clear. So I don't know if we have now enough time to read other questions uh, before the break. Mar Martina, perhaps um, you can show the ones related to the radio label positions. Yeah. Because for, for us it was not clear. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. we have two yeah. about the radio label position. The one uh, presuma, pre, presumably you define different radio label position in appendix one as well to generate data entry tables for different labels in three results. Is this correct? And the other one is, I guess, in appendix first table, also two different labels must be included separately, which means two times the same matrices single oral. Yeah. Yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, you have the ability to to add the the second radio label, and we could go back and 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 do that, or we in. Uh, We would have to go back to uh, materials and methods. Uh, add the second radio label. And in this case, oops. Again, carbon 14 for the label number. Check down below, make sure we have the selected element. Yes. Now, on the previous radio label, it was uh, in the ring structure, the aromatic ring. And now we're going to uniformly label it in the, in the dione ring as well. Uh, again, we could we could fill in up above carbon. Oops, we want to specify. Uh, That's why it's important to specify where that radio label went. Uh, I'm just. Going to, well, we could put this in, but I, you, I think you would understand that we could have uh, different specificity, uh, specific activity for each. But the the point is, is that radio label one is still there. Uh, the C the C fourteen aromatic mesotrione, and on that that ring, and this is uh, quite often used where they'll they'll use uh, uh, multiple labels for tracking different metabolites. Uh, remember 
in the example uh, that I drew out for the appendix, we ended up with two metabolites that for which this ring was cleaved. So we no longer found that. So uh, um, the advantage of using the two radial labels helps to elucidate uh, some of that uh, met metabolite tree. OK, so okay. what else did oh, we had in the appendix? Under the treatment groups, so we added a second uh, radio label. Uh, we could go ahead and include that in here as well in our in our definition. So in theory, you could have a uh, in in this instance where we've got uh, males and females, low dose, high dose, urine and feces. Uh, could be specific for the uh, aromatic label and then some uh, for the um, uh, for the uh, dione label as well. Uh, a lot of a lot of times what you'll find in these studies and from my experience looking at them is we we have a single reference listed. Uh, a lot of the studies are broken up. There could be a second reference uh, associated with this study. Uh, so what I'm what I'm trying to say is the the first study may pertain to the aromatic label, the aromatic C14. The the second reference, if a second reference were added, might involve the dione C14 labeled mesotrione, and in that instance. Uh, a second appendix would be created. So in, when we laid out the groundwork, we have appendix 1A, there would be an appendix 1B that would be created for that second radio label, you know, where that information would be uh, processed and held. So um, there are uh, features built into the system to capture that. So I don't, I don't know. Have we got time, Martina, for for any others or? Um, I don't think so. Juan, what do you think? No, I think that um, uh, we should have now the break. Um, if needed, uh, we can come back to other questions at the end of the webinar if there is a still uh, some time available. Uh, because I think that the one of the most important part is this one, Appendix 1 and Appendix 2, but uh, now we should uh, have the, the break, the 15 minutes break, and then if there is time, we can come back uh, at the end of the webinar. Otherwise, we will uh, reply in, in writing uh, to the questions. Well, hello. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're, I guess we're moving on off of the break back to part three. Uh, dealing in the results section as far as constructing tables. Uh, this section will work with the pharmacokinetic studies. So where we are in, in terms of the screenshots of our composer, are we, as a recap, we began with the general info, work through materials and methods, jumped over to the appendix and set up the two appendices, one for the treatment groups and the uh, second appendix was for the chemical structures involved for the parent and the and the metabolites. Now we're over to Roman numeral three results. So this is divided into two sections, the A pharmacokinetic studies, B uh, metabolite characterization. Uh, this session uh, refers to the pharmacokinetic. So we've uh, we'll move to that that par particular um, uh, screen. So uh, if you open the program, you may find a, a sample table above and there's an icon here to get rid of it, you know, to, to either hide or show that example table. Um, there's some uh, copy and paste features for tables. So there are some shortcuts. If uh, uh, two tables are very similar in here that 
that you want to capture, uh, say for example, a, a table devoted to uh, urine uh, values uh, over time. You would, uh, uh, and likewise you had one that the only difference was for feces, but the table construction was essentially the same except for the, the matrix. As far as tools to actually build your table, uh, this icon over here uh, refers to adding a table. So you would do that when you want to build a new table. Uh, delete a table, remove something that you didn't want, obviously. Uh, there's an icon here for managing the columns. And uh, these three uh, pertain to either adding a row, inserting a row, or deleting a row in your table construction. So in, in working through this, you would obviously click on the first icon to add a table. And in this example would be under the excretion tab. Uh, I should take a, a second and move back through these. Under the pharmacokinetic studies, uh, there are a number of tabs uh, for preliminary experiment, absorption, other, excretion, and half-life. Now, uh, my colleague Juan had, had gone through and tried to do some mapping of, of these uh, table types that we might expect to see and what is really called for in the OHTs, the uh, OECD harmonized template for mammalian uh, metabolism studies. And what's lacking is uh, distribution type tables and uh, that certainly fit under other. Uh, also, there, there should be a spot for enzyme activity and bioaccessibility as far as, as uh, table types to capture. Uh, there's enough flexibility built in to table construction where you, you should be able to uh, uh, capture those types of tables in addition. So we've clicked on the icon to add a new table. Uh, the next step would be to add a, a title for that table. In this case, you would just uh, click on the, the cell for uh, the value and, and type in the, the table type. Uh, and in here was a, uh, a columns title. So this is uh, generally where your units would be within the table. In this case, uh, uh, a lot of these studies will will refer back to uh, in terms of a percentage of radioactive uh, dose administered. Uh, there's a, a, as I mentioned before, a, a column uh, management, uh, a column editor uh, built in here where um, columns can be added. Uh, say in this, this case, we were adding uh, uh, time uh, over uh, measurements over time uh, in this given study. So there's already uh, pre-populated in this screenshot a six-hour sample. Uh, there's a, a, a spot down here where you can do a custom column editor. Uh, you'll notice that there are, are no entered or pre-entered tests yeah, within the system. Uh, this will, will come into play later on when we talk about the metabolite characterization table, so that's very important. But for now, we're going to focus on using the custom column. So we'll put in a 12 hour. Uh, conceivably, we could put in an 18 hour and a 24 hour. Uh, there's also uh, some flexibility built in uh, where a general column label could be added. So uh, if we wanted to distinguish between male and female at those time points, we could do so. So that column as constructed would be six hour uh, for male, 12 hour for male. And we could go through and, and again, create those time points uh, for both genders. So at this point, uh, we've, we've gone ahead and added those in. We've got uh, uh, male and, and female also listed in here across those various time points. Just go ahead and hit close to accept that. And we've got a string of, of columns added out for each of those time points. Um, under here, uh, we want to begin adding rows to the table. 
And so by hitting that plus icon, we have the ability to add a row. And we'll do so. And in this case, what I've done, and I've, I've jumped ahead a little bit on you, is I've added a row and typed in urine, typed in feces, and then put a total in here. Um, and then actually put values in. Uh, population of values, just filling out a matrix like you would uh, a table in, in Excel or, or any other piece of software. Uh, there's a spot for a population of some text to, to explain the absorption and excretion. Uh, you can add multiple tables. So in this screenshot, I've added not only a single table, but uh, three additional tables to this. So let's let's go over to the uh, do a live demo. I think that's where we'll get the the most out of this exercise is uh, to actually start working with the software and show how we'd go about uh, building a, a, a table. Uh, clicked on results, Roman numeral three, and we are on pharmacokinetic studies, the five tabs, as I had mentioned. Uh, let's go ahead and, and maybe uh, choose other, and you'll see there's an example table, but uh, let's go ahead and get that out of the way. So we've got a clean palette to work with. Uh, so in building a table for this section and the procedure that I'm going to take you through would be um, you could adapt that to any any number of these tabs. So, it, you know, the, I'm going to build a distribution table, but it could likewise uh, uh, be used for uh, building an absorption or an excretion table or if you wanted to put half-life values or, with, or some rate constant information in here, you could construct a table to capture that specific information. So we'll go ahead and hit the first icon, add a table, and we'll come up with a, uh, a title here. And let's just say uh, recovery of radioactivity. In excretia and tissues. Oops. Tissues of rats. Ghost with, uh, well, let's put fourteen uh, C. As we'll try on at one and fifty milligram per kilogram. Uh, column title, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, most of these studies relate back to. A percentage do of, of radioactive dose at administration. Uh, we'll go to our column editor and Let's go to custom column. And we'll add mail. Add. Go ahead and type in again. Uh, female. So we'll get all of these columns added. Now I wanted to build this to capture information. Remember from our title, we talked about uh, two different dose points at one and 50 part per million. So let's set up appropriate columns to do such. So we're going to need male repeated and female repeated. And we could do a couple of things here. We could either uh, simply call it 
high dose. So you click on where you want to add the general col column identifier. So male, high dose, set. And we could go back to the female. It should be present in our drop menu. So again, drop down menu, high dose, and it, it adds. Uh, we wanted to also get the low dose. And hit set and female low dose. So a pretty simple table as far as an example. Uh, and I'm satisfied, I think we're done. I'm gonna go ahead and hit close and we have that set. Now let's start adding some, some rows and to do so, we need to go up here uh, to the plus icon and you can simply type over urine, for example. Let's add another feces. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Pardon me. Uh, under and we're get, we're going to get to that in just a minute. So we've got urine. We wanted to be on here. Remember to move your cursor. Lesson learned there. Uh, add another row. Cage wash. Another row. Uh, just maybe a composite sample of tissues and carcass. Almost done. And let's have a row where we summed up the total that was found. Uh, as far as an identifier here, you see I, I overwrote this at one point. You can do a right hand click at this in the blue box. I'm sorry. I guess it's a double click, uh, general column label. And for up here, we wanna just simply maybe mention uh, sample but you have the flexibility of, of changing this as well. So there we have our matrix set up, low dose, high dose, males and females. We're gonna look at what was compartmentalized in the, in the distribution uh, over urine, feces, cage wash, tissues, carcass, total. So let's, let's actually populate some values, 54.15, uh, 24.50, So again, while I'm adding these, I think it's uh, it's most importantly for the meta path as far as being able to capture the uh, met metabolite characterization part of the studies. Obviously, we're we're drawing maps. We're trying to link metabolites to treatment groups air maps, et cetera, et cetera. But there is also value in capturing uh, this, this uh, pharmacokinetic information. So if you can at all supply that information as well, it helps to, to give a, a more complete study. All right, so we've got numbers in. Essentially, we're done with our table. Uh, you could, uh, if we were to add a second table, you would just go up ahead here. Uh, let's do something uh, to illustrate or to give the example of uh, copy the table, and we'll see how this works. So I've clicked copy table, moved over to 5B, paste table. 
So we've got some extraneous columns that kind of showed up on us. And we can go ahead and and uh, use our delete function to get rid of those rows. I'm, if I said columns, I misspoke. I meant rows. We have some extraneous rows that were duplicated in the function. So you have the, the flexibility of being able to clean up things. So we'll have a uh, an exact copy. Uh, let's say this was not found. Just to show you some differences. So here's uh, table 5A, 5B. So there's uh, time savers built in where you can copy tables, save yourself a little bit of time. Uh, maybe uh, this would fall into play if we, uh, for some reason, we decided to build tables for um, the low dose and high dose separately. Um, you also have the ability to um, incorporate a, a time course and how you might do that is to uh, along your your rows incorporate male um, urine uh, male feces etc and have your time course across the top so um, i don't know i i'm thinking that maybe one example is enough But that's that's pretty much going to be it for uh, constructing pharmacokinetic tables. And I think I'd like to reserve a little bit more time for the uh, metabolite characterization study. So uh, I know it was a, a bit of a, a short set, but I think we can we can probably move to uh, asking for any questions out there on constructing these tables. Okay. Rick, thanks a lot. I will move to the Word document. So we had uh, some question about the, um, the possibility to copy and paste data from Excel or Word tables or to use uh, um, templates uh, to save let's, time. Yeah, let's let's uh, work with the, the first one. We we're limited somewhat by the, the capability of the software at this time we do not have the ability to incorporate Excel or Word tables. Uh, unfortunately, they need to be rebuilt. Uh, that has been brought up for consideration. Um, I guess that's what we can we can say about that. Uh, okay. can, can you import whole tables from Excel? At this point, no. Uh, okay. I, I, we don't have that import feature. Uh, is there any template that can be used to upload all of the data rather than doing this manually? Uh, again, unfortunately, no, not at this point. Uh, this piece of software, the DER Composer, was was uh, and is uh, probably about 15 years old now, so it's it's in need of of an upgrade. Uh, it's what we have right now. It works very well for uh, being able to pull the information into MetaPath. Okay, so I think uh, you replied. I most, of, most of those are. I and I and I realize, uh, you know, as far as the uh, being able to to be time savers. Uh, yes, that would that would say if a. A tremendous amount of time were you able to paste in from additional pieces of software, uh, but right now the the logistics just don't do not uh, do not afford that ability. Okay, we have um, maybe we can reply to this other question. Uh, if uh, at one time point no value is given, is there a special type to in not given or not detected and where to put such abbreviation in the text above uh yeah let's let's actually go back to the software and uh well in this this table let's you go ahead and you can put in an nd not detected yeah rick you can share your screen oh hey thank you <laughs> 
I guess you can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> no, indeed. Now, yes, thanks. Okay, now we're good. So what I what I did here, just as a, a recap, I moved ahead on you. Let's take out some of these values. And not detected, but in this case, let's say we had a not sampled. And again, there may be uh, in the guidance document as far as what data fields to capture, there may be some guidance on on what uh, shortcuts to use. So ND just might refer to not detected. And NS. Not sampled. OK, now a couple of points. I'm going to bring this up that it's permissible to do this. In the case of of uh, the pharmacokinetic studies, but there will be a reason to avoid this in the metabolite characterization studies and you're going to have to wait until the next session for uh, for me to uh, detail that information. OK, um, Martina, do you want to go back or or what? Uh, yes, maybe I can read another question. Uh, just uh, read it maybe. Is there any consideration given to build templates so that data can be uploaded or we can implement simple copy paste function in the future? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if that will be handled in the next revision. Um, by that I mean when we go to the MSS uh, composer. Um, Okay. These are these are all these are all good questions, and they're they're not new questions by any means. But uh, as I say, we we try to improve on on what we have. But as with everything, it takes resources. Okay. So thanks a lot for the reply. Um, maybe. I don't know. We have time for another question. We already replied, but maybe you can also uh, give your opinion. Let me share the word document. OK, can you see it? Yes. OK, will the other tab be used also for distribution data? We reply yes, indeed. This other tab can be used for distribution data. And maybe uh, you can confirm these. Uh, yeah. OK, perfect. Yes, yeah, the short answer is yes. And I think I I had mentioned that uh, there's also uh, enzyme activity. Might be another another table for capture in the results section and and uh, that could be also captured as well as uh, uh, any bioaccessibility type tables. So uh, there is there is flexibility built in and I I think maybe early on by design that other was designed to capture that. I would hope that any future revision of the composer that though that an actual devoted tab for for uh, distribution would be would be uh, invoked. So it's like you know it's it's like the is like the poor child that needs a home. You know, we've got a place for absorption. We have a place for excretion, but uh, distribution, uh, we need another tab. OK, perfect. Uh, I think now we can continue with the other uh, part of the results. OK. So yeah, yep. thanks. So we'll go on to uh, part four, uh, the results section from metabolite characterization studies. And uh, what I've done 
is moved on from the. Uh, uh, Sorry about that. Things happen. Uh, so I, I, I want to again uh, bring you back to where we are in the uh, software as far as the composer. So we, we progress through general info, materials and methods, went to appendix where we set up our treatment groups as well as the metabolite uh, uh, table. Uh, moved on to results, talked a little bit about pharmacokinetic studies, and now we're into tab B under Roman numeral three, the results metabolite characterization studies. So uh, what I want to caution you on at this point is that when we're using uh, the columns in the column editor, we want to conserve the treatment groups that were already set up in Appendix 1. Uh, very important because there's a uh, feature in Metapath, the highlight treatment group, which um, I think I've got a screenshot forthcoming that will illustrate that. It's kind of a, a quick and dirty picture of the metabolites and what matrix that they're found in. So uh, and here it is. Uh, so this is actually a picture of Metapath. And I think Juan in his initial presentation had shown a couple of screenshots of Metapath and what is expected. Uh, so you have the uh, different Rick, folders. Rick, again, sorry, I, to, Rick, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Uh, if you can always uh, again mis minimize the the window. Oh, of the yeah. Okay. I'm I'm sorry Thank about that. No, no, don't worry. Thank, Thank you. But I I just want to I I don't want to turn this into a metapath webinar because we want to focus on the the der composer. But I do want to illustrate the importance in the metabolite characterization. Um, section that we maintain the treatment groups with the chemical structures because what you have before you is a screenshot of Metapath uh, and this happens to be for uh, metrophenone so you have a, a, a parent structure and a number of metabolites and what is signified by uh, this icon it, it looks like a little sunburst in the program and hopefully many of you We'll get into using Metapath itself, but the utility of this feature is to draw the correlation between the treatment groups and what is found in them. So specifically what I've done is uh, checked a number of those treatment groups that are listed. So there's a number of common fields within Metapath. So in this instance, it's a rat in vivo oral, uh, it looks like a single dose of 10 milligram per kilogram, et cetera, et cetera. But the only difference might be male rats versus female rats and the ultimate matrix. So we've got urine, feces, cage wash, and tissues, and likewise female urine, feces. So what I have focused on here is I've, I've checked off those treatment groups for both male and female and urine and feces. So this picture or this quick exercise on Metapath uh, would tell us which metabolites were found in each of those matrix. So if we wanted to find something that uh, um, we look at the green, for example, the green and the, I guess it's kind of an aqua color. This particular metabolite is only found in the feces. So wherever these boxes are, where there is no red or, or fuchsia, the, those metabolites are exclusive to the feces. That's the only matrix they're found in. Uh, likewise, you could run into gender differences here, uh, which were specific to males, which were specific to females. So this as a tool in Metapath is very important for a risk assessor. 
you could come up with the uh, answers to questions rather quickly um, as far as uh, uh, compartments where, again, where metabolites could be found, uh, any gender differences, any dose differences. So again, it's it's critical to use the treatments group treatment groups that were described in Appendix 1. And again, the reason for that is to conserve the relationship between treatment group and metabolite to conserve this highlight treatment group function. All right, so what you'll find when you hit <coughs> the create a new table icon, just as we did in the pharmacokinetic studies. So we clicked on this icon and you'll find what happens are the metabolites that were created in Appendix 2 are auto-populated. So these rows will show up automatically whenever you create a new table under metabolite characterization. So that's one link. Uh, second to that, you'll notice when columns editor opens, you know, so you, you would then go to this icon for column editor. The column editor panel will come up and you'll see a number of pre-populated studies. And then it just remains for you to click on an individual uh, treatment group, hit the dark arrows to move it over to your columns that you'll expect to see in your table. In addition, you still have this <clears throat> general column label uh, option available to you, so you can add more definition. So in this example, we went strictly with numbers and letters to define those treatment groups. Not very, um, very well in as far as explaining what 3A represents, but under 3A, we can certainly add that it was for a male high dose urine sample. So with all of those set, and again, the metabolites preset, we have before us a matrix. And this matrix um, works wherever a number is put in, the box denotes correlation between the metabolite and the, and the treatment group. So in other words, where that metabolite is found. Um, so this is the basic structure of that table. And again, just to reemphasize what I just spoke of. So whenever a value numerical is placed within a cell, it indicates an established correspondence between the treatment group. These treatment groups again arose from Appendix 1 and the metabolites as listed that came from a, Appendix 2. And during consumption of the XML that's created from this software, when this is migrated or imported into Metapath, that's what will define that highlight treatment group function. Now, caution. And I, I mentioned this in, when, in the last section. If a metabolite is not found in the treatment group, please leave the cell blank. Do not populate with an ND or simply uh, you'll see just a hyphen at times. Refrain from doing so. Just put your numerical enter, entries in and leave blank wherever there is no correspondence between metabolite and treatment group. Okay, uh, to finish the table, additional rows can certainly be added. Now I mentioned that these metabolites were pre-loaded when the, the table was first constructed. You certainly have flexibility to add additional rows or for that matter, insert an additional row. And in this example, what I've included are uh, a row for unidentified metabolites, uh, tissues, cage wash, and then certainly uh, uh, a total for that. 
Now let's go to the live demo and actually work through some of this. So again, where we left off was we were in uh, Roman numeral three, the results. We built a couple of tables over here. Uh, we we're under pharmacokinetic studies. Let's move over to metabolite characterization. Again, they give you a, an example table, but we're gonna go ahead and, and hide that, get rid of that. Uh, first step would be to create the new table. So we're gonna click on that. And you'll see what, what's happened here is uh, the rows are, are populated for us. Uh, meaning those metabolites from the appendix. Now I'm just going to take a minute and move back over to appendix two. So these rows, you know, uh, six of them, mesotrione and the five metabolites were all transferred over automatically for you. And the importance here is the exact spelling or the exact way that these are denoted you know, so all of a sudden, if you decided you want to write this as 4-hydroxymesotrione, do not, because that will change the correspondence that was listed in the Appendix 2 table. So maintain those as they are uh, written in the appendix. And you shouldn't have to worry about it. You shouldn't have to change anything. They're all pre-populated for you. So, uh, before we, we move on to anything else, let's put a title in here just to be complete. And let's say uh, metabolite uh, characterization in, and let's be specific and let's just deal with urine. Rats following oral dosing Add a couple of doses. Let's say at one and fifty uh, milligrams per kilogram. And again, uh, let's uh, let's put for our units on the columns. Percent administered dose. Okay, next would be to create some columns. So we'll go to the column editor. And as I mentioned in the screenshots, um, these are available to us. So let's uh, let's grab urine uh, mail. And in this case, uh, there's, there's a lot of, of description already covered for us uh, in the way that we set these up. So we've got mail, Low dose urine, yeah, we want to grab that one. Uh, let's grab the um, corresponding female treatment group. and the female uh, urine as well for the high dose. Okay, uh, we could come in here and add general column information as well. Uh, I, don't, I don't see any need for it in this instance, but you certainly could. It's not going to mess anything up. Uh, I'm trying to think what else you might add. I think that pretty well defines it. So we'll just run with it. And at this stage, we're, we're set. Again, I, I want to 
emphasize, and I'm going to go back here for just a second. We want to emphasize that the test groups are very important that you maintain them. Your treatment groups do not alter these, do not change it because the system will be looking for these specific columns. Don't don't get uh, creative and start playing around in the custom columns. Uh, you could, but you're going to lose that correspondence between treatment group and metabolite. All right, so let's uh, let's start populating some values. Uh, let's say that five hydroxy wasn't or four hydroxy wasn't found. Three, so we'll just leave that blank. Oop. I don't want anything for our intermediate. Remember, I don't want to be lying to you that it was not found in the study. Sorry for the pause, I just want to get through this. And we'll see if those numbers make sense. OK, as I mentioned before, uh, caution, do not, you know, so it, very tempting to put an ND in here, not detected, or just a, a slash line or a hyphen or something. Do not do that. Just leave it blank where you don't have any correspondence. Um, the other other feature, you can begin adding rows. So let's say if we want to add a total identified. And let's put some total values in here, 48, and then moving it across, 56, uh, 49, and 54. Uh, you could also uh, be more creative here and add a couple of unknowns, which is the case. They may isolate a, a given fraction or a given metabolite, but just simply don't know what it is. So these are all, all things that could potentially be showing up in your tables. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, if we wanted to have a, a summary total un unknowns. And uh, generally, sometimes you might find a, a cage wash. And then just generally uh, uh, a feces because we were talking about urine specific metabolites, but just there was a, a component. Some of the distribution of, of chemical was found in the feces. So um, I don't know if these numbers are going to make sense, but we just uh, finish off our table. We got 98 or whatever. No, that's that makes no sense. 36, 25. Um, again, I'm just reaching some hypothetical numbers in here. Just to complete the table. So this is basically what your table would look like. Again, I want to stress using the exact metabolites as far as their nomenclature, where they came from, Appendix 2 and Appendix 1, the, uh, the, the treatment group. All right.
Uh, likewise with the other sections, you can create a another table and another table after that. So you can you can uh, run off a, a number of different tables. So in in the idea of of making a nice tight package of of urine and, or you you have that option where you could have added all of the feces columns here and stretch this table out to eight columns or you have the flexibility to create a dis distinct and separate table for feces and, and you could have a third table if it were set up in this in this particular study for bile so uh, again there is somewhat flexibility again uh, you know that in order to maintain that highlight treatment group that copy fee paste feature just is not not uh, not feasible as far as bringing in um, other tables from other pieces of software so i i think that's about what i had for metabolite characterization so uh, we could move move on to some questions Yes. But I'll I'll reserve the right to come back to I I kind of snuck in a part five where I've I've got some conclusions I just want to run with you um, so but for now let's let's break in Martina if we have any questions yes indeed for this part which uh, I think is uh, very important we had a lot of questions so let me share the word document for some of them we have. Uh, already reply but maybe we can start from the most critical sure so does metapath include identify metabolites under characterization while the guidelines differentiate between identify and characterize i i treat them as uh synonymous i i think you know if they've been identified I, I think they are characterized. Uh, characterization might take you one step further, where you might have, um, you know, that's that's a good point, and I, I want to bring that up too. There, I'm wondering if the the question maybe pertains to uh, qualitative versus quantitative, and I'm I'm kind of guessing without any additional information. Because you might run into that situation where in a study, um, and I believe that the guideline calls for, it's either 5% or 10%, isn't it? If a metabolite is less than, so it's the, and forgive me, I'm a, I'm a research chemist, I'm not a risk assessor. So, but I, I seem to recall that if a metabolite is over 5% or 10%, then they require uh, quantification and identification. But you might run into an instance where it was identified but not quantified. So you you could have the uh, qualitative versus quantitative idea and uh, how this might affect us in the table. And I'll reserve the right to come back to that uh, in and demonstrate that in the software, how I would handle that situation. OK. Uh, can we can we switch out and then come back? I want to maybe do that before I. Yeah. OK. OK, so the question was and I'm I'm reading into this that. Well, let's say. Uh, as you're reading through the text of a study. They looked at this MNBA metabolite and found that it was present, but they weren't able to qualify, quantify it. Okay, so then, you know, we don't have any quantified numbers for it because it was not measured. We don't know what percentage. Say if it was a, a percentage less than 1% or less than 5% or, or something along those lines. What I would I would do in here is you have the flexibility of, of putting in a code. Oh, sorry. So I've done this shortcut too, where I've maybe uh, strung out 
and let's say it was not found in the male high urine for whatever reason, or nor the, the female urine, but that metabolite was observed, but it, there just wasn't enough to quantify it. So what I would do is I would put that definition down below, and I would write something to the effect, um, you know, metabolite, Metabolite observed, but not quantified. So you don't want to lose that correspondence or that that setup for the highlight treatment group. For you know that that correlation between the treatment group and the metabolite appendix one and appendix two, you don't want to lose that feature, you know, so that it indeed was found. All right. Uh, Martina, go back. Yeah, OK. Let me share. So there is this other question. I noticed that there is no build pathway option as with MSS. So there is no way to check visually that your pathway looks uh, right before it ends up in Metapath. Uh, I'm trying to think as far as and that's I'm going to get into the next sec section as far as rendering a report and I don't believe it was built into the report either. Uh, the best you can do is uh, looking at it in table form. So I'll, I'll defer that question till later. You are correct there. There is no immediate screen. Uh, construction of the. Of the proposed metabolic pathway. OK, perfect. That's, so that's, yeah. go ahead. Yes, to come back to the table, does the metabolite quantitation table accept range values? I don't believe so. And then can you use the less than symbol? We no, try I to would have. I would avoid those. OK. Then also, I think this is a very relevant. In the example table, PPM and TRR are provided together. Would you propose to separate these values in different tables? And what are the rules to separate information like treatment groups or matrices or labels? I I would I would separate them. Okay. I I think it I think it would the example table I think would be confusing to follow that. That's that's my preference anyways. Okay. I, you, you know, you could certainly you could certainly put that into the column under you know, the, the general uh, custom feature that you can add, you know, so so you could include units. And in fact, you might want to do such if you're talking about a number of different rate constants if they were provided in the study. So you could conceivably have different different units on different columns. So I guess it, it's a matter of preference. OK, uh, on the same yes, topics, uh, we have uh, another question. It is possible to include the less than uh, limit of quantification or less than 0 0.001 ppm? In, in the pharmacokinetic tables? Uh, no, I think in the metabolite table. Uh, Again, uh, the metabolite characterization table. The purpose of that is to draw that link between treatment group and metabolite. So I would, I would caution you to avoid that. OK, uh, then we have. Uh, 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 
we, uh, Martina, we basically covered that when we, we talked about, you know, that level of quanti quantitation. Uh, that would imply, you know, what I what I tried to do in just the example that I worked on where I put a, a series of maybe six ones and then define that as such. So I think that's what they were talking about is that uh, if you could scroll down a little bit. You know that there we are. Is it possible to include? So I think. Basically what we did is the level of, of quantitation LOQ is what I was getting at by doing that you know, with a series of ones. So use a code to capture that maybe. OK. Clear. Uh, so then we can go through this other question. If uh, all of these have been done for one active substance, uh, can these can be reutilized subsequently a few months later for another active substance as a template to save re-entering the general info tables as the study designs are often the same? We try to reply to this, but uh, maybe we need uh, your confirmation. So uh, we are not expecting to have the same results, so right. they could be OK. Then I think this could be also relevant. Do the rows update automatically when updating the appendix? Uh, I don't think so. So that's why it's important. And and uh, that's why uh, I think both Juan and I mentioned it as far as as how to how to use the composer, how to work with the composer. So there's a, a specific way of, of working through um, the information. So you go through general info, you work through the materials and methods, and then bounce over to uh, the appendices. Now, the word automatically is is kind of the, the word that, that trips me. It's not, so if you go back to your, Say you start working in this example, you start working on that results table. And then you were you think, oh, well, I missed a metabolite. I'd like to go back and add it. Oh, look, I made an even further mistake. I forgot that metabolite when I was filling out the appendix. So you go back to the appendix, you add that row for the new uh, metabolite that wasn't captured. And then you could go back to your results table and insert a line just make sure that you've copied the name of that metabolite exactly the same as what's listed in the appendix and you could insert it and that that connectivity would still be maintained but automatically no you would have to go through that exercise of of adding the row and then uh, copying the exact name uh, so if you wanted to make sure you got the name exactly right, go to the appendix, go up to where the, the name identifier is, copy it, and then paste it into your table. OK. I think he's very clear. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, this we already replied. Maybe we can reply to other questions since uh, we are on time. Um, is there a restricted number of tables? No. No, I think you can add. I've, I've added as many as I think eight, eight or ten tables in the past. So maybe that's the challenge for someone out there, if you can break it. But as far as I know, I do not believe there is any limit. OK, perfect. So let me check. We have other in the chat. How to handle co eluting minor metabolites? Oh. Yeah, I know what you're I know what you're getting at here is. Uh, in some instances. Uh, tables may list as a 
a uh, uh, well as a, a a combined, you know, co-eluting. So let's say if the four hydroxy and the five hydroxy were not resolved in the study, and they said that there was, and they gave a percentage of twenty percent of the administered dose was found, but they they labeled it as a combination of four hydroxy and five hydroxy metabolites. So what I would do in the interest of that in conserving the metabolite characterization is I would I would keep them separate and I would just split that value. Even though I don't know exactly that 10% was four hydroxy, 10% was five hydroxy, that ratio could be skewed but the take home is, is that we want to be able to uh, maintain the, the correlation between treatment group and single metabolite. So treating the 4-hydroxy and 5-hydroxy separate. Uh, what you could do is add a footnote down below and specify exactly what you did. And say that these, uh, these two metabolites were unresolved uh, therefore, 50% was attributed to each or something along those lines. And that's how I've handled that situation. Okay. Uh, so we have other question regarding the table. Uh, so for instance, I can copy and paste here. If you added a table by mistake, how can you delete it? Yes, there's a delete function on there. Uh, I believe it's uh, icon right next to it. So if you were looking at the composer, I could always pull that up. I don't know if you want me to briefly do that. Maybe best. Oh. Okay. Um, I'm going to I'm going to uh, show you here is when we added a table this icon and the icon right next to it for purposes of deleting a table. So if we wanted to delete this table, just click on it. Are sure you want it? Yes. Yes, we do. And table B, we can delete that as well. All right. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, we have another question related to the previous one. Uh, so, if we can uh, reutilize the, uh, the template uh, for another active substance as a template to save time. Uh, so related to this, uh, for sure the results are not the same, but if we cannot reuse the work of a previous active substance as a template, does this mean we have to start from scratch for a new active substance? For a new active substance, yes. I, I would recommend because there is so much work involved in, in the general info and in, in the materials and methods when you're drawing in structures. And then, uh, you know, there's no guarantee that the appendix is going to be laid out the same. You're going to have the same treatment groups. And certainly these structures are all going to be different for a new active ingredient. Wherever, wh however, where this could be a time saver is if you ran into a situation where you had a different species. Say if there was a, a rat study for mesotrione and there was also a dog study or a mouse study, that would be easier to handle because oftentimes the metabolites and the metabolite tree would be very close if not identical. So in other words, this could be modified a little bit. The treatment groups could be modified a little bit. You might have to change dose, but there would be value in using the, the same uh, XML that was created for the rat 
for those other species. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, sure. So we capture the reply. Um, I don't know, one. Uh, what do you think we can uh, go? If, if you could give me five more minutes to wrap things up in the next session, and then we'll, uh, and then I think maybe proceed to one to finish, finish out the webinar. If that sounds like a reasonable plan. Yeah, for me, fine. Okay. So we'll go back to where we left off. And part five, I have uh, basically conclusions. Uh, I just, you know, I want to maybe emphasize to you that this is uh, an older piece of software and, and hopefully uh, a revision will be made to follow more of, in line with the MSS composers. Uh, I want to point out what happens when you're done, or for that matter, if you're not done working on on populating a, a composer with a with a metabolism study. So in this case, uh, we we hammered through, we made it through uh, population of the entire process. But uh, if you only had a limited time, a half hour a day or an hour a day to work on on capturing a, a specific study, you could do so and then save that XML and come back to it and work on it later. So this this saves your work and it's a, a good idea to, to maybe frequently go back and save your work so you don't lose anything uh, in this data capture process. So there's a couple of icons built in. The green icon is to save. It's a save function. The blue icon to save as. And where the save as could fall into play is if we had uh, a, a second species. So again, you know, and I mentioned that in the Q&A session um, about if we had a mouse study or a dog study that was very similar to the rat, we could we could use some of that information that was already populated. So you click on that, the save as command, the blue icon, this would come up and you would just give it a path and give it a, a name uh, to save it somewhere on your, your computer. Another feature to uh, generate a Word document or a uh, 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 report, if you will. Uh, that icon is up above and I might have mentioned that on and the very first step of, of introducing the composer to you folks. And uh, it generates a, a Word document before your very eyes, again, following the, the data evaluation record template. So I'd like to do a, a quick uh, live demo. Uh, over here, you know, this is how the save as command uh, functions. So we wanted to save it as uh, well, let's see if it. Let's keep mesotrione. And this was a rat study. And there'll be some suggested and uh, prescribed ways of, of saving the uh, submitted studies. But we could save that. And then we could do a, a save as. And in this case, let's call it a, this would be for a dog study. So we could just change it. So now what we've done effectively is to save two copies of your work. And we could modify the second one, the mesotrione dog, uh, to conform with the results of that, that study. OK, uh, the other uh, demo to point out is generation of that Word document. So we click on this to generate the Word document. And let's call this uh, meso. I own port. And then all you have to do is hit save. And your report begins to process. So everything that we essentially captured in, uh, in this demonstration is 
is uh, coming to us in, in the form of a Word document before our very eyes. Everything down to the tables, how we set them up. Uh, the metabolite characterization study. What went into your appendix be coming up here. Appendix 1A and this is Appendix 2 with the metabolites. And now it's finished. So it, it's very rapid. Uh, the question was raised, is there a way to check on your metabolites as you're entering? Uh, this would be a quick way of doing that uh, because you, you get the, the Appendix 2 created in this report. So you'll get a two-dimensional structure. You could go in here, make sure your atoms are arranged correctly if there are any mistakes. Uh, it's a, a good way of QAing your work is to create this document. Uh, all of the names are here. Uh, the chemical names are also included. Any of the parental linkages, i.e. that is where the, the uh, metabolites came from. So I think that's uh, about all I had. And uh, maybe we'll, if there are any questions on this or if we can transition back to Juan, um, I'm about done. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rick. I think uh, one, uh, because we do not have a question for now about this. So maybe we can uh, go back later on to previous question or if you prefer now, I don't know. Otherwise, I could pass the, the floor to one. Yes, indeed, uh, Martina. Thanks a lot. I think that we can go on with the next presentation, and then uh, if there is time, that I assume so, we can go through pending Q and A. Okay. So, thanks a lot, Rick, for your clear explanation. I think that it has been very useful to go into the details of the dirt composer. Now uh, I would like just to summarize what are the key points in this data entry and from and the project, what are the main uh, next steps? So I can also clarify some of the questions you already have during the Q&A that have not been replied yet. So let's start with the sequential composer data entry flow. So you have seen uh, with the explanation of Rick that uh, the composer uh, reflects the content of a uh, normal study design with general info, material methods, results, discussion and conclusions. But the data entry flow is not following exactly this order. So for general info, you need to go to material and methods, materials, then appendix one, appendix two, then two, we come back to materials and methods, study design and methods, and then we can go on with results, and then discussions and conclusions where you have, once you have finalized, you have the option to generate the Word document and to save the XML file. So now go, we are going to go step by step and to highlight what are the key points that you don't need, uh, you uh, need to remind, don't forget. So once you open the composer, please remember to select the rat and not the livestock. For the livestock, we have a specific MS composer. So once you have selected the rack, uh, it is important that for the European submission, you include the EPSA param code. This is the EPSA code number. In the manual that will be published in the coming days, you will find information where to find the param, EPSA param code for your Arctic substance. Please don't forget uh, to uh, use the citation ed editor and to generate table for this reference. This is the most important part from the general info. Then you move to 
material methods where you need to include here uh, the information regarding the radiolabel test material and the non radiolabel test material, where you need to include uh, your structure by drawing uh, or, or using a smile coding. Please remember that under test animals, you should use singular for the species, so the rat, and then we will like, ask you to also provide the strain. Then from this, you move directly to the appendixes. That is one of the most important part of, meta, of uh, the Metapath Composer. So in appendix two, you will have the different test numbers. This matrix is reflecting those uh, uh, body fluids and tissues on which metabolite identification has been carried out. So this matrix will explain the different treatment groups. And then in appendix two, uh, it's important to have the chemical name and we will propose to use the code name for the chemical name because this information is displayed in Metapad. And of course, as Rick clearly mentioned, there might be the need to indicate some expertise here or whether this is assumed by the author and has been clearly explained by, by Rick. Then once Appendix 1 and Appendix 2 has been filled in, you need to come back to study design and methods and you need to describe the experimental procedure according to the given fields. So all this narrative uh, text. Then you go to results where you have two tabs, one for pharmacokinetic tab and the other one for metabolite tab. For pharmacokinetic tab, you have different sub uh, tabs on which I am showing you now in, on the screen one example regarding excretion. And then for the metabolite tab, that is one of the most important for metapath is uh, this one in which you describe the amount of the metabolite uh, formed in the different uh, matrices. So please don't change the auto-populated names coming from appendix, as has been already indicated by Rick. When filling here the amount of the metabolites, please use numerical values, so leave the cell blank if there is not correspondence. And it is important here in the columns header to refer to the test number that has been filled in previously in the appendix. Then you can move to uh, discussion and conclusions and you can include a very short conclusion about the study autos, for example. Then please don't forget to save the XML file. You have also the option to generate the Word document. So this is uh, really summarized what has been explained by Rick. And again, the red arrows reflects the order on which you need to enter the data. And for this reason, uh, we might not we, uh, we might not reuse the data for another active substance because uh, this information flow should be going in this direction, so might not be reused for other active substances if you are using the same XML file. So this is the summary on the sequential data evaluation record composer data entry flow. And just briefly, what are the next steps for training manual? We didn't publish yet. We didn't want it to, to wait until uh, this webinar uh, took place because the instructions given today, so the slide that has been kindly prepared by Rick will be in, included in the, the manual. Also for you to know that it's very important that although the composer is slightly different architecture to the MS composer, this training manual uh, will complement the ANSES, ANSES training manual that has been done for the MS composer. So some of the recommendations from the ANSES training manual will be applicable to the DER composer. And I think that you will welcome and this 
uh, we have acknowledged that uh, asking you and um, referring now to the applicants that need to provide the data on the OHT 58, on the OECD harmonized template 58, and also in the their composer, it's uh, some uh, duplication of work. So we would like to ask you, and it will be clearly explained in the training manual, which fields should be mandatory in the DER composer versus recommended fields. Uh, of course, uh, we would like to have the DER composer as much as possible completed, but the mandatory fields will be the ones that are needed for the correct functioning functioning of the metapath. So once the XML is included, uh, uploaded on metapath, uh, it will allow it to work properly with the XML file. And of course, we are going to focus on the metabolism part of the composer. But all the specific fields will be that are considered mandatory and will be indicated in the manual that as mentioned before it will be published in the coming days and of course all the procedural questions that have been raised today we will tackle uh, this and we will try also to uh, reply already in the manual so you will have a complete training manual for the decomposer so all the instructions of today so rick slides together with my slide on the flow on the information flow how to enter the data will be in. Then for next steps, uh, we have a contract. EPSA has a contract with the software developer on which in the next one of the next steps, and this is one of the of the questions that you had during the, the webinar, is that we wanted to update the architecture of the RAD Composer from the DRR to an MS architecture. So to have a more user friendly uh, layout on which all you can also see the metabolic pathway as the MS composer. On this work for updating in a short term basis, uh, we will try to to align as much as possible to the OECD harmonized template OST 50A. And for this, we have also uh, and the help of uh, uh, BFR uh, and that is looking at the difference between the OHT 58 and the DER composer. So we will have this on board for the update of the of the software. And in a long term basis, uh, we would like to explore with LMC. Uh, and of course, this is not only related to the DER composer, it's also related to the MS composer to see uh, the interoperability between IUCLID and Metapad uh, because we wanted uh, to have this uh, alignment, but this will be in a long term uh, basis. So this is uh, uh, my, the end of my presentation. Um, now we will have a Q&A session, uh, but then just in case uh, we didn't manage to answer all of your questions, please feel free to resubmit them uh, to this uh, web page, uh, to this uh, uh, email link that is on, shown on the screen. As mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we will publish the, this recording. And, and from events uh, team, it's very important that you give your um, uh, evaluation form fill in because this will allow us to improve uh, future webinars. So thanks a lot, uh, all of you for attending. And thanks a lot, Rick, for your great collaboration. It has been really uh, very appreciated. And now, Martina, if uh, I seen that, yes, indeed, we, we have uh, some time. So we were planning to finalize in 20 uh, minutes. So, so we have still some time to reply some of the questions that had not been re yet replied. So I am going now to give the floor to you, Martina. Yes, I hope you can see my Word document. Uh, I highlighted in green some questions that uh, are pending. So with regards uh, to the uh, seroisomer and isomer, uh, the question is, uh, is it possible to prepare a separate table for the quantification of stereoisomer? 
for instance, enantiomers of the parent compound, which is also quantitated in total. I think uh, this Rick is for you. Yes. I'm I'm really wondering what they're getting at is if a separate table. Uh, I'm you know I, I would see no need to to create a separate table if you had each of the, the stereoisomers as a separate metabolite. They could reside in the same table. Or, you know, it, it depends how the, the study was done too. If, if you have a, a parent chemical, oh, well, you're, you're talking about a mixture it's really a mixture experiment? Uh, I think uh, yes. I think yes is uh, under this uh, this topic. It, it would all depend on the pathway. You know, if, if uh, you know, one of the enantiomers gave discrete, or by that mean uh, separate metabolites, you know, if if one of the enantiomers gave metabolites one, two, and three, and the second enantiomer gave metabolites four, five, and six, then you you would might put them into a separate table. But if you had cross, you know, so if if each of the enantiomers could potentially create the same metabolite. You know, that is a, a metabolite that lost its stereo specificity. Then I would include them in the same table. OK, I don't know how, how clear that was, but. No, it, it was uh, clear. Thanks a lot, Rick. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then we have other pending question. Uh, yes. I think that we already reply about uh, the isotope labels without radioactivity. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you could go through the same process in pulling up, you know, that little periodic table, that icon, but just put 13C, you know, 13 for your, your number. You could list that. Okay. And in fact, I have seen mixed studies in the past where they've in, invoked the use of, uh, oh, maybe as many as two different C14 labels, as we showed for an example, but then they also used a C13 label as well, a stable isotope. So. Okay, perfect. And then I think we have another also under the uh, structural part. I think the structural topic is the most uh, uh, discussed. So if you had all possible structure where you don't know the exit position of the OH, how do you make it clear in the pathway that you did not the uh, whole of these metabolites as discrete, uh, discrete metabolites? E EI. Uh, that they are all possibilities for the same metabolite? I, I would rely on when you're creating Appendix 2, I would rely on the uh, use of the expert, the expertise, and I would, I would click the box for expert judgment and just state that for each and every one of them. So if you had, for example, uh, an aromatic ring and it was possible to have ortho, meta or para hydroxylation. I would I would check the box on each of those three structures if I included them and then put the little the little note under the expertise that uh, was not defined in the study, but um, 
this this possibility was provided by the expert. So I guess that's the way I would handle it. OK. Perfect. I think uh, one, do you see other question that may be relevant? Because I think we reply almost all. Yes, I think so. I, as mentioned at the beginning, all the procedural questions uh, will be tackled into the manual or, or by writing and replying in writing. So yes, for all questions that are technical, scientific, um, I think that we we have reply. So yes, I think I don't really see any other uh, questions that we need to address now. So no, indeed, I don't see any other question. Yeah. Okay, so meanwhile, Martina, uh, did we receive other questions? No? Yeah, okay. indeed. Uh, okay. We receive another question. What would happen if the metabolite's name or codes change through the lifetime of the active substance? Uh, copy. By the code. My name. You know that that is very possible, and I think I think you could run into it uh, if you had two or three companies trying to market the same active ingredient, and maybe they all ran independent metabolism studies. It's conceivable that they could come up with different names for those metabolites or a different code for each of the metabolites. I think I think what really drives the and this is true about Metapath is that the unique feature is that two dimensional structure. Represented by the smile string. Because the fact of life is that most of these metabolites are so new, are so reserved to uh, the, the, the unpublished studies that you will not have a Cas number associated with a metabolite. But what would be unique is the, the 2D structure as resem, resen, uh, represented by the, the uh, smile string, as I mentioned before. OK. And in fact, I've seen, I've observed that, that very, that very situation. OK, so let me check. Well, that was a, that was actually a good example that was shown in the mesotrione. Um, you know, there were two metabolites. I believe one was, was uh, uh, characterized or named as AMBA which might not mean much to anybody you know and another another company could submit the the same pathway come up with the same metabolite and they might call it x triple two for whatever reason you know so um i think what would happen in metapath or what what happens in in all situations is you you rely on that two-dimensional structure to differentiate So one, I give the floor to you. OK. So thanks a lot to all of you for attending this webinar. It has really a pleasure to have Rick with us uh, to explain to you how the their composer should be feeling. And thanks a lot to all of you for attending this webinar. So I wish you a nice evening, uh, night, uh, afternoon, depending where you are. Thank you. Bye bye.